6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The parallel verse to Malachi 3, 6 is Hebrews 13, 8, and the parallel verse to Hebrews 13, 8 is Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord God, and I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. Well, first of all, He doesn't change in His love. His love is unconditional. God loves you no matter who you are, where you've been, or where you're going. God loves you for who you are. You may be a bone-headed, wretched, vile, wicked sinner today. Under the sound of my voice, you may have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but yet God still loves you. Still loves you. You say, you mean I don't have to get something to gain God's love? Nothing. I don't have to act a certain way to get God's love? No way. We humans have a hard time understanding that. And here's the reason we have a hard time understanding it, because we love other people and they love us, not primarily unconditionally, but they love us based on what we do for them or what they do for us. Amen. And when they don't do what we think they should or what we think they should do, then all of a sudden they don't think we love them anymore. And if we have the right kind of love, which is unconditional love, which is agape love, which is the love of God, we would love them anyhow. The closest person in this room that comes to, we'll say, duplicating the love of God is a mother. I admit that. Moms, you just have a love for your children that a dad doesn't have. Not that a dad doesn't love his children. A dad does love his children. But a mother, that love is unconditional. That, that attachment that there is for seven, eight, nine months, a part of her body, a part of her anatomy, a part of her being, uh, just provokes a love within that mother that only a mother can have. So God's love has not changed. I want you to know, secondly, God's mercies have not changed. Lamentations 3 and 23 says, God's mercies are new every day. Now I'm going to tell you, out of all the attributes of God, mercy is probably first on my list. Now I like the love of God, don't get me wrong. But I thank God for his mercy. Boy, if it were not for his mercy, there is no telling where I would be at today. I would be like perhaps my 50-year-old brother who's in prison. I'm the oldest of five in my family. There's one boy, one boy, twin girls, and one boy in that order. Had it not been for the mercy of God, I could have taken a wrong direction, a wrong route, a wrong choice, made a, a wise, an unwise decision, and I could be in prison like Matt Brown is in this morning. Matthew Timothy Brown, that's my brother, named after the biblical names of Matthew and Timothy, but he has lived anything but a biblical life. But God still loves him. And I still love him as his big brother. But I can tell you this, Matt Brown has brought most everything in his life upon himself. He has refused and rebuked the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. And he's where he's at today because of it. If you're sitting here this morning and you think God doesn't love you, think again, he does. But if you think about the mercy of God, you're sitting on a pew this morning because of the mercy of God. The mercy of God allowed you to get up and get out of bed this morning to do the things you did to prepare to come to this worship service. The mercy of God allowed you to have traveling mercies to this church. And I pray that you will have traveling mercies from this church. We take all this stuff for granted. We're just going to get in our vehicle. We're going to drive down the two-lane 15 highway or ever how you go home from here, and everything's going to be okay. But many people go close to home and die close to their home. And without the mercies of God, where would we be? Thirdly, the grace of God doesn't change. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I am glad for the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God. I'm glad that God's grace extends all the way down to a wretched sinner just like me and a wretched sinner just like you. And if you will reach up and you will reach out to the grace of God, you will find a loving hand, a merciful hand, a gracious hand that is willing to accept you like you are a sinner apart from God and God himself will receive you. 
God never changes. Never changes. He's never had the thought. Have you ever thought of it like this? If God could change, he wouldn't be God. If he could change. If God could change, he wouldn't be God. So, preacher, what is it you want us to know this morning? Three things. God never changes, first of all, according to his word. We are in a great culture battle today. The forces of evil are still killing babies in our nation. The forces of evil kill around 50 million babies a year. Every year that the sun comes up, goes down, the sun sets, the sun rises, the calendar clips off another page, and we'll be doing that, Lord willing, on midnight, Monday night, and we'll be entering into a new month called March. Abortion, we don't think much about it, but I can tell you God hasn't changed his opinion on abortion. It's still murder. And the United States of America is fortunate still to be standing as a nation today because of his mercies. If it were not for the mercies of God, America would, would, would listen, would be destined to go the same way the Ukraine's going right now. We need to pray for the people in Ukraine. They don't want Mr. Putin in their business. They want to be a free society. And yet our own nation is being the biggest hypocrite here. We are monitoring the borders of a sovereign nation, and we're not even taking care of the borders of us, a sovereign nation. That is hypocrisy, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Good preaching, Brother Rick. Keep it up. Some of you have gone to sleep at the will of your life. Yes, I'm for helping Ukraine. I am. But you've got a Congress and a president, primarily Democratic, that mentioned, in fact, the news media got on a, they got on a, a, what I call, they got on the word sovereign Friday. Fox News, if you watch it, or Newsmax, if you watch either of those, and those are the only two I would suggest to you watching. And on Fox and Newsmax, they ran the, oh, CNN was wearing the word out, sovereign, 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 sovereign. And as each one of those persons spoke it, I said, what idiots. They mentioned that Ukraine is sovereign. They've never said a word about America being sovereign and all the illegal immigrants coming across our border. I mean, that's idiocy, folks. But that's the narrative they're selling. You see, God hasn't changed. Amen. God doesn't change in his word. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's quote the word of God and let you decide for yourself. And in fact, Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand how long? Forever. Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, and one day it will, but my words will not pass away. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me tell you something, friend. God's word has not changed. Abortion is still murder. Homosexuality is still an abomination unto God, though it is widely accepted, widely embraced. Today, in our culture and being widely accepted and widely embraced even in church circles and being widely accepted and widely embraced even by some of you. God's word hasn't changed. God hasn't changed his thinking. God's not going to change his thinking. The Word of God is God, and God is the Word of God. The Bible is the record that we hold on to. It is a precious record. Inspired, infallible, inerrant. 
It is what this preacher tries to feebly preach week in and week out and have been trying to do it for now almost 43 years and I'm still trying to do it today with as much zeal as I first did when I first started because I believe the word of God then and I believe it today. God hasn't changed. He's not going to. No, the subject is not up for debate. We're not going to have a called conference to see if we can get God to change. We're not going to vote to see whether the Bible is the word of God or not because it is. Number one, mark it down. God's word never changes. Before I move on, preaching has changed today. Tremendously. And not for the better. Oh yes, we still have the David Jeremiah's and the Charles Stanley's and the Adrian Rogers. Locally, we have guys like the Roy Schulitz, Brad Waters, the late great Daryl Quinn, some other guys I could mention, Mike Stone from Emmanuel and Blackshear. But we have a whole bunch of preachers today that have tried to lighten up the word. They, they preach what I call the word of God light. Because they don't preach all of the counsel of God. They preach part of it. They preach some of it. God never changes. According to his word. Secondly, God never changes according to his will. What is the will of God? It is the prescribed method, the prescribed avenue for my life and your life. What is the will of God, preacher? Well, God has two wills. He has a perfect will. He has a permissive will. Perfect will, permissive will. You say, what is God's perfect will? Glad you ask. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is long-suffering. And he's long-suffering to usward. And he's long-suffering to usward when it comes even to salvation. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, where that fits on your Calvinist scale, I don't know. Where that fits on your Arminian scale, I don't know. But I know where it fits on the biblical scale, and that's what I am. I'm a biblicist. God's not willing that any of you should die without Jesus and go to hell. That is the perfect will of God. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4 and 5 says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He'd washed it white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood they lose all their guilty stains. They lose all their guilty stains. God has a perfect will for your life. You were created in the image and after the likeness of God. It is God's will that you be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. As a Christian, it is God's will for you to marry another Christian. We move from salvation to marriage. The most important decision in your life is what you will do with Jesus. The second most important decision in life is who you will marry. 
who will become your mate, who you will spend the rest of your life with forever and ever and ever here on this earth. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26, that God created in the beginning, male and female created he him, male and female created he them. God is still in the marriage business, and by the way, it's still a man to a woman. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rick, for enlightening us. We have a Supreme Court that in 2015, June 26, said it was okay for two men, two women. God says no, male and female. Did you hear that, church? Male and female. That is man and woman. You say, why are you bringing that up? This crowd right over here. These young people right over here. These children sitting right over here. They're, here. they're hearing the other all the time. They, In fact, they could go to most churches and they would never hear, hear in their church said what I just said. You, you're lifting yourself. Oh, no, I'm not bragging and lifting myself up. I'm just saying they'd never hear it. Too many pastors today assume that everybody knows everything. No, they don't. Somebody asked me one time, said, Preacher, do you know everything? I said, no, I don't even know all the questions, let alone all the answers. <laughs> Guy come out one Wednesday night, mad as he could be, finger at me. He says, you know everything. I said, no, 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 no. I said, God knows everything, but I said, I come close. I almost know everything. <laughs> That set his hair on fire, and he didn't have much on top of his head to set on fire, but it set it on fire. Yeah, Christian, you're to marry another Christian. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That verse is not just for marriage, that's for business relationships, that's for other relationships in life. Even your best friends ought to be Christians. Your best friend ought not to be a sinner. Does that mean you can't have sinners as friends? That does not mean that. But it means your closest relationships, associations ought to be with the people of God. Whether talking marriage, whether talking business, whether talking whatever, recreation, whatever you do in life, it is God's perfect will that it be that way. So it's God's perfect will that you be saved. It's God's perfect will that you marry another Christian. It's God's perfect will that you serve Him. It's God's perfect will that you be baptized by immersion. It's God's perfect will that you join a local Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. It is God's will that you give 10% of your income at least to the Lord because that's His to start with. It's God's will that you read your Bible every day. It's God's will that you pray every day. It's God's will that you witness to people every time you have the opportunity. That's God's will. Perfect. But quickly on the flip side of that, God has a permissive will. Did you know God will permit people to go to hell? I said permit. Did you know he'll allow a Christian to marry a non-Christian? When I went to high school, the unsaved girls were just as pretty as the saved ones. In fact, some of them were prettier. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean the unsaved ones. I mean, oh boy. Woo, woo. I'm not so sure Jezebel wasn't a good looking woman, but she sure wasn't been a woman I'd want to date or marry. Jezebel, some of you, who's Jezebel? Look it up in your Bible, okay? Hillary Clinton compares closely to Jezebel in the Bible. <laughs> I'll, I'll just put it that way. I'm not sure she's worse than Jezebel, to be honest with you. God will permit you to stay lost. God will permit you to marry a lost person. God will permit you to work your job, raise your family, and all those things are highly commendable and miss church. God will permit you to live every day without ever opening up a copy of God's Word. God will permit you to live your life without prayer. 
Because the only time you'll really pray in your own lost condition is when you need something or want something or some emergency takes place. You see, friend, God's not God's not and I'm not a puppet on his string. You have what is called a free will. And sometimes we all exercise our free will over God's will. Yes, it happens in my life and in yours as well. But in a lost person's life, it happens all the time, every day, all the way. They don't know any different. They're unsaved. They're lost. They're blinded by the power of Satan, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. They don't know any better, don't know any different. At funeral services, sometimes people will say to me, Preacher, I don't know how lost people get by when a loved one of theirs dies. Can I tell you how they get by? That's all they know. But see, us Christians, we've been on that side of the fence, and now we're on this side of the fence. And I'd hate to know I ever had to face anything again like death without the Lord. But you see, I know that now. I didn't know that when I was unsaved. I just knew that that was a part of life, that everybody's going to die one day. I mean, I knew that before I became a Christian. So did you. And lost people get by that way because that's all they know. But even besides that, they have some friends. And sometimes they're Christian friends that attend the funeral service in support. Maybe send them a nice sympathy card. Maybe send them a book. Maybe they go to the visitation at the funeral home and they love on them. But let me tell you something. Those lost people, they may not understand that, but that's what we do as Christians. God's still providing comfort for them even though they don't understand its comfort. Yes, God has a perfect will, God has a permissive will. Number three, God never changes when it comes to his way. His way. God says it's either my way or the highway. You choose. You say, you think God says that? In no uncertain words, I think he says that. Yeah, I don't, I can't quote you a verse that says that, but if you look at scripture and look at God and look at man... That's exactly what, how many times did God say that to Israel? Choose my way or judgment. He was saying to them, choose my way or the highway. You want to do your thing? Do your thing, but there's going to be consequences. People live today as if there are no consequences to anything they do. They just do anything they want to do, and maybe, maybe so, maybe not. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. The Bible says, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he also reaps. If a man sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if he sows to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. What is God's way, preacher? Well, I could hold up my Bible if I had it in my hand and tell you that's his way. All of the Bible, all of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation and everything in between, from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between, that's God's way. And when I do not operate by God's way, I will face certain consequences. If you reject Jesus Christ here on this earth, when you die, the moment you die, you will be in a place called hell. There will be no turning back. There will be no coming back. There will be no prayer you can pray. There will be no second chance, no second opportunity. But you know the average person doesn't believe that because the average person doesn't know that. Remember, unsaved people are blind. 
They're also deaf. They can't hear. I'm talking about spiritual things. And it's up to preachers and people like you to tell those who don't know Christ that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Yes, I think you can use hell in your conversation and witnessing. I use it, not every time, but sometimes I do use it. No, I don't mention hell every time I preach, but I think you would say if you were fair, you mention it quite often. Yes, I do, because I don't want people to go there. His way. Jesus said straight, and narrow is the way that leads to life eternal. And few there be that find it. But broad and wide is the road that leads to destruction. And he said, many be which go in thereat. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the ends of those ways are death thereof. Proverbs 14, 12. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jonah 2, 9 says, Salvation is of the Lord. Psalm 19, 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, Converting the soul. Acts 4.12 says, There is only one name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Paul said in Romans 10.13, For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has a way. And it's not just a way, it is the way. And the way is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Preacher, what about all these other religions and denominations? I can't help that. I can only tell you what the Bible says. And then you, through the help of the Holy Spirit, will discern and will discover what the truth of God is for your life. Without the Word of God and without the Holy Spirit of God, there would be no way any of us could know the truth. And when we know the truth, Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you, set you free. There are lots of people sending under my voice this morning that are in bondage. You're not a free person. You're enslaved to somebody or to something. It may be to fear. It may be to a dollar bill. God never changes. If he can spare the three Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, he can spare you. If he can spare Daniel from the den of lions, he can spare you. If God can open up the Red Sea, it part on both sides, God can open up the way in your life when it seems impossible. And He can part the problems you're going through so that you can get through to the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, we serve a God that never changes. He cannot change. If he could, he would not be God. And though you and I change, and sometimes that's for the better, and sometimes that's for the worse, God never changes. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can go to the bank. You can count it done. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, today we give your name praise, honor, and glory. Thanking you for who you are. 
thanking you, God, that you never change. You never change. You're the same. Your word is the same. The rules do not change. Right and wrong does not change. God, your will is the same. Jesus came to die so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. That is still the same. So God, speak to hearts today. Remove the doubt in the audience from who God is and what he does. Help, Lord, people to respond to your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing a hymn of invitation. You come as God has spoken to your heart today. Without him I could.